exactly 12. Before things get too crazy tonight, let's go over some of the more important races in Colorado. There are three ballot initiatives this year, and perhaps the most controversial is Amendment 64. That's the one that would legalize adult possession of limited amounts of marijuana. Adult, in this case, means over 21. That's key in this amendment. It would also allow governments to license and regulate cultivation and other facilities. It would also require the General Assembly to impose an excise task, tax rather, of wholesale sales of marijuana and dedicate the first $40 million raised to building public schools. Amendment 65 would instruct members of Colorado's congressional delegation to both propose and vote in favor of an amendment to the U.S. Constitution limiting political campaign contributions and expenditures. The amendment would also require Colorado's legislature to vote to ratify such an amendment if it ever had the opportunity to do so. Amendment S would increase the number of state employees who would be exempt from the state civil service system. It would also change testing and hiring procedures in the state personnel system, expand hiring preferences for veterans, and make adjustments in the state personnel board. In Greeley and Evans, voters will decide whether to authorize $8.2 million in general obligation bonds to help pay for a new middle school to replace the aging John Evans Middle School. The money would provide the local matching funds for a state grant of $21 million to finance the total $29 million school. The ballot measure would increase taxes paid by Weld County District property owners by $845,000 a year. Well, that in and of itself is a lot of information to digest, but there's still more coming. We'll have Connor McCabe from the uh, UNC Mirror in studio a little later to help us break down the Colorado, pardon me, let's try that again, the Colorado races. Say that five times three. Mm, anyway, and the ballot measures. Now we have all 65 seats in the Colorado House of Representatives up for re-election. Much like the U.S. House, a good majority of these representatives should retain their seats, but let's take a look at some of the key races and who Coloradoans will send to Washington. Weld County voters will help decide whether to incumbent Republican Cory Gardner will serve for a fourth term as district representative. His Democratic opponent is Colorado State Senate President Brandon Schaefer. In other House races, incumbent Democrat Deanna DeGette faces off against Republican Denver businessman Danny Stroud in the first district. In the second district, incumbent Democrat Jared Paulus is up for re-election against his Republican challenger, State Senator Kevin Lundberg. Third District Republican Congressman Scott Tipton is running for another term against Democratic State Representative Sal Pace and five other challengers also in that race. In the 5th Congressional District, incumbent Republican Doug Landborn faces no Democratic challenger, though three minor party candidates are running against him. Republican 6th District Congressman Mike Kaufman's running for re-election against Democratic State Representative Joe McClosey. And in the 7th District, Republican Democrat Ed Perlmutter faces a challenge from Republican businessman Joseph Coors Jr. Weld County voters will have more, a few more races on their plates when they hit the ballot boxes tonight. These races are for state boards and CU Regent, races that primarily are not local or national governmental races. Republican Pamela Manzanek is running against Libertarian Stephen Dellinger for a seat on the State Board of Education from District 4. Democrat Stephen Ludwig is running for another term as an at-large member of the CU Board of Regents. He faces three challengers, including Republican Brian Davidson. Excuse me. Twenty members of the state Senate are up for election, though none are from Weld County. All 65 state House seats are up for election election, including two from Weld County. In District 48, Republican Stephen Humphrey battles Libertarian John Gibson, and in District 50, Democrat Dave Young is running against Republican Skip Taylor. 19th Judicial, Judicial District Attorney Ken Buck is running unopposed for another four-year term. Also in the judicial realm, Colorado Supreme Court Justice Nathan Coates is seeking to be retained for another 10-year term on the court. Six members of the Colorado Court of Appeals are also up for retention vote. In the 19th Judicial District, four district court judges face retention vote. They are James Hartman, Elizabeth Becker Strobel, Todd Taylor, and Dinsmore Tuttle. Well, it's no secret that Colorado could be the biggest swing, at least one of the biggest swing states in the country this election. So how exactly does that impact the voter? What does it really mean? Bear News reporter Rachel Turnock sits down with a few experts to help educate those voters. Not sure how, to, uh, how important Colorado really actually is. It's no surprise that Colorado is a highly contested swing state in this election. We had the opportunity to sit down with Professor Kelly Scott and UNC student Connor McCabe to talk about why it's so important. The difference between a swing state and the other states is that swing states aren't guaranteed to a candidate. So you probably heard on the, on the news or what have you that there are blue states and red states. Those states are already guaranteed for those candidates, and the candidates being the Republicans and Democrats. Colorado, as well as North Carolina and I think seven or eight other states um, are considered swing states, 
or purple states is another concept that I think that's a term that floats around out there. And so what that means is that they're neck and neck, and that could be the voting history of that particular state. Um, and interestingly enough, Colorado is historically a red state. In the last two elections, we've been considered a swing state. Once you start seeing a flux in the history of how a state votes, that's when they start to be considered a swing state. That and then the, the number of registered Republicans and Democrats that are considered active voters, which is to say they voted in the last presidential election. Um, what that means for Colorado is that, or say North Carolina, is that you're going to see an increase in advertising. And that's going to be television advertising, radio advertising, and then billboards and yard signs, all the outdoor advertising that we see. In the course of this presidential election year, Colorado is going to see more visits than Texas because Texas is fairly locked up for the Republican vote. Um, also what you see is more activity. So like the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention typically are going to be held in what are considered swing states for that year. Four years ago we were also considered a swing state. The, the Democratic National Convention was here. Um, so good news is we get more attention. Bad news is we see more ads. <laughs> <laughs> the most common uh, types of advertising or techniques in advertising we see is negative advertising. And this time, more so than I've paid attention to four years ago, is the idea of sound biting, where they, they pull out a portion of a speech um, and they play that portion of the speech in a negative light against the op op opposition. So. One that we keep hearing over is the undercover yeah. camera that caught Mitt Romney um, talking about the 47% who are, feel like they're entitled and they don't pay their taxes and some other things that he said. But we see these third parties coming in and taking that soundbite and creating a negative ad against Romney. So it's not even really a campaign for Obama as much as it seems like it's a campaign against Mitt Romney. Good news we get more attention. Bad news, we see more ads. Senior political science minor Connor McCabe talks about the election and Colorado as a swing state. Colorado, in the United States electoral system, right now has nine electoral votes. Uh, when it became a state in 1876, it originally started with three, and it has had nine since 2004. Uh, overall, Colorado as a whole has kind of more adopted its swing state nature as of late. In the last 10 elections, uh, we've only uh, voted Democrat twice, and the first time was in 1992 when Bill Clinton uh, defeated George Bush Sr., and again in 2008 when President Obama won the presidency. Uh, so it's definitely swayed more to the Republican side, and then as of late, it's kind of been a little bit of back and forth. Now, both campaigns will try and use a lot of strategies in Colorado since it has such high stakes in this election. First one is they develop these organizational networks. So what they'll do is they'll register voters, but they will also at the same time be working for a respective political campaign. So the registering is the, um, the uh, non-partisan part, but the fact that they uh, volunteer for, the other, for, the, for a specific party does play a role. As a swing state, we need to take it upon ourselves to do a little bit of extra research. Reporting from Candelaria, Rachel Turnock, Bear News. Thank you, Rachel. A little bit of breaking news into our studios now. Uh, we have an update on the Brandon Schaefer, Corey Gardner race in uh, Colorado Congressional District 4. Uh, as of right now, Brandon Schaefer is down to Corey Gardner by 108,592 votes to Schaefer's 69,911 votes. Also, we have an update on Amendment 64. As of this moment, it is passing currently by a 53-47 margin. Dale? Well, and we also have one other update. We have uh, New Hampshire that has now been called for President Obama, and that is uh, 55 to 44 percent uh, vote total. And that puts the Electoral College vote at uh, 158 votes for the president and 154 for Governor Romney. Well, as we touched earlier briefly, Democrat Brandon Schaefer is running against Republican Cory Gardner for Colorado's fourth district seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, that might beg the question of who are you voting for? Well, one candidate was in town for him, and the question wasn't who, but why. Bear News reporter Danny Gross has more on that story. 
3,000 state employees in the state of Colorado that are covered by the personnel rules of the state of Colorado, including about 500 employees. Obama. Game is about over. Instead, Schaefer spoke to students and community members on the importance of being an engaged citizen. Thomas Jefferson, right? The price of liberty is eternal vigilance, right? Every two years, you have a, the opportunity in our representative democracy, in this process, you know, that is very nuanced, is very complicated, state employees in the but state. it's also brilliant. Schaefer stressed the value of focusing on policies instead of parties. It only works when people are willing to disregard labels, Democrat, Republican, Independent, and focus on the work that is done, right? Focus on the policy. That's the only, only way the process works. And that, you know, perhaps is what's so difficult or what's so frustrating about our system right now is this not working the way it's supposed to work? Because at the end of the day, people are vote, voting based on the letter after a person's name on a ballot and not based on the policy that he or she is advocating for supporting um, either in Washington, D.C. or at the state capitol. Right? So Schaefer is running against incumbent Representative Cory Gardner. Reporting from the University Center, I'm Danny Gross, Bear News. And Schaefer's speech was hosted by the Institute of Professional Ethics. And we just had this handed to us. So they've called the swing state of Pennsylvania. This is a big one. Uh, with a uh, 58 to 40 percentage points. And uh, that would, should bring up Al uh, Obama's electoral count up to about 178 to 154 for Romney. One of the more confusing measures on the ballot this election season is Amendment S. But what exactly does it say? Amendment S will directly affect the hiring process of classified staff, which consists of workers who go through a standard hiring process, regardless of the institution in Colorado. Marshall Parks, Director of Human Services at UNC, sits down with Bear News to explain what will happen if Amendment S passes. There's about 30,000 state employees in the state of Colorado that are covered by the personnel rules of the state of Colorado, including about 500 employees here at UNC. So as a result of, of that structure that we have, it requires a constitutional amendment to make the changes mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Um, this, this change would allow us to consider some more subjective factors and also allow the hiring people to, to get to talk to six people instead of three. Okay. Um, so that's one of the main changes. The other two main changes to UNC, I think, are it would allow us some additional uh, veteran preferences for mm -hmm. veterans to apply. Um, and the, the last one is uh, it allows us some more flexibility in temporary hiring. At this point, we can only hire a temporary employee for six months. Mm -hmm. uh, the change in Amendment S would allow us to hire temporary employees for up to nine months. With it being a presidential election year, the very limited campaigning has come from the pro side. Park explains the positive and negative of Amendment S passing. Um, those who are in favor of the amendment will say this is kind of just a modernization of a personnel system that was created in 1920 and it hasn't had a major, major change in, uh, in like 40 years. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, it, it makes more sense to allow us to have more discretion in hiring to be able to consider more subjective measures and, and maybe have our hiring process look a little bit more like a, yeah. a private hiring Absolutely. process. So their argument is, is that, and again, uh, there's an argument that says that we want additional uh, preference for the veterans. Um, the, the other argument for it is that a governor who's elected probably should have the flexibility to be able to, one of the pieces we didn't talk about that uh, is also part of the, uh, the referendum is, is to allow um, uh, the governor to appoint uh, up to 1% of the total number in the personnel system. There's 30,000 folks in the state personnel system now, so it allow the governor to appoint up to 300 uh, folks. So people that work in the senior executive service, uh, it gives them ability to appoint more folks and have less of them be selected to the classified process. Um, so, on, the, on the opposite side of it, most of the opposition of it, um, there's a little bit of opposition uh, certainly to the um, allowing the subjectivity, uh, more subjectivity in the hiring process that um, again the system is designed to keep it from being, to be, have people selected on their merit and not have favoritism or um, nepotism, et cetera. And um, on the uh, opposition side, they'll argue that this opens it up more to that. And the, and the primary opposition you see is on the, the governor's role in the personnel board. Um, that it gives the governor additional authority and additional, um, uh, I've seen argument that it makes, it gives him and his deputy directors additional almost um, authority to make, make rule. 
Different classified staff include kitchen, construction, and groundskeeping workers. Well, all that information can be a little overwhelming. Luckily, we have Connor McCabe, news editor of the UNC Mayor and political science minor, here to help us break everything down. Connor, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ben. So I'd like to start with Brandon Schaefer uh, running for Congressional District 4 against Cory Gardner. Now, he is currently the Senate president uh, in Colorado, and he has been serving there since 2005. He was previously the Senate majority leader um, as well. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University in political science. He also attended naval science at University of California, Berkeley, and then he received his Jurius Doctor from Colorado University. Now his opponent, Brandon Schaefer, has been representing Congressional District 4 since 2010. He ser currently serves on the Committee of Energy and Commerce. He received his bachelor's degree from Colorado State University and also his Jurius Doctor from Colorado University. You know, they sound like two very, very accomplished men. Um, there's, there's kind of a, a discrepancy, though, in the money that they've raised in their campaign. Not in a bad way, but just kind of take us through that. Well, yeah, it, it's very hard to talk about politics without talking about money raised. Uh, in this race, Brandon Schaefer has raised a little over $800,000 and spent $700,000. Um, but where his differs from Cory Gardner is his, a lot of it was from individual contributors, whether large or small. And now Cory Gardner, on the other hand, he's raised roughly two, a little bit over $2 million for his campaign and spent about 1.5 of it. And so the majority of his campaign money came from political action committees. And now ever since the United States Supreme Court ruled on the case Citizens United versus Federal Action Commission, it has been, political action committees have since played a very large role in politics. And that will be discussed later a little bit with Amendment S as Colorado joins Montana for the only two states to be voting on that to hopefully reform that decision. Yeah, we'll talk amendments in uh, just a few minutes. I wanted to ask you also about the 2012 Farm Bill. Both of these men were heavily involved in this bill. Kind of take us through how they were. All right, so Cory Gardner was very involved because he was in Congress at the time. And so the 2012 Farm Bill was going to bring funding, among other things, to farmers uh, across the nation. Now, in 2012, especially Weld County saw one of the harshest droughts that it has seen in a while. And it primarily affected uh, raising of livestock and that sort of thing. So for Weld County, it hit it very hard. And Cory Gardner, for one, was very criticized for voting uh, not to bring the bill to a house, to a vote in the House of Representatives. It passed the Democratic-led Senate, but wasn't allowed to go to the House and received much criticism for that, especially with Weld County uh, the whole district, Congressional District 4, ranks top 10 in terms of agricultural producing in the nation. And Weld County alone ranks top 10 for agricultural producing in the nation among counties. Now, Weld County, area-wise, is one of the bigger congressional districts in the state. Kind of tell us a little bit of a background on CD4. Well, yeah, CD4 has definitely been Republican. Uh, in the last 10 elections, now keep in mind this is House of Representatives, so it's up for every two years. So since 1992, a Democrat has only won once, and that was in 2008 when Betsy Markley defeated Marilyn Musgrave. But besides that, Republicans have done very, very well in this county. Their largest margin of victory coming in 1992 when Wayne Allard won 79% of the votes. But Cory Gardner currently holds the seat, and he did beat incumbent Betsy Markey by nine percentage votes in 2008. Okay, so it's well it's well established, well documented that CD4 is important. However, it's gone it's undergone a bit of a change, as has the rest of Colorado's congressional districts with redistricting. Right now, in, take take us kind of how that happens, why it happens, and what the map will look like for the 2013 Congress. Right. So the whole state of Colorado was really affected by this redistricting map. Um, and so when you redistrict uh, counties in Colorado, you don't need a court to review it for uh, the federal house and senate, but you do for the state house and senate. But uh, interesting enough, this map was uh, brought to court by the Republicans, but a district court judge did rule in favor of Democrats, the plan that they provided. Now, it saw races like Mike Kaufman uh, get a little harder because he had more of a diverse population in Florida to worry about. But uh, unfortunately for candidates like Brandon Schaefer, he lost Larimer County. And now Larimer County, uh, best known for Fort Collins, and Fort Collins could have really helped him out this race, is a very strong Democratic county. And he will hurt with losing that county. Now, we, um, we actually have a map of the uh, congressional district. So if, uh, 
if we could in our control room show you these maps. Here we go. This is the current map of how it looks today, right now. This is uh, all of the Colorado districts in 2012. And then this is a map of how they'll look in 2013. And as you can see, they, they are losing Larimer County like you talked about. And Larimer County really is a Democratic stronghold. How, how will that affect the race in favor of either Schaefer or Gardner? Well, it will definitely affect probably Schaefer more and Democrats for the future if they want to win Congressional District 4. Um, Fort Collins, obviously very well known for Colorado State University, definitely leads more Democratic. Uh, it will just mean that Schaefer will certainly have to work harder, and this could mean very good news for Republicans in the future for Congressional District 4. I also wanted to ask you um, just briefly, we, we've heard about it all in the news, we've even talked about it tonight, how important is Colorado to the national race? Well, Colorado is very important to the national race. Uh, since it became a state in 1876, it started out with three electoral votes. It has made its way up. It gained nine electoral votes in 2004. Now, Colorado has more recently become a swing state. In the last 10 elections, it has only voted Democratic once. Uh, that was first uh, for Bill, in 1992 for Bill Clinton's first presidential run, and then again in 2008. Now, the interesting thing about Colorado is it has a very good sense of choosing the president or voting along with the president who wins the White House. In the last 10 elections, it has an 80% of times that they've picked the, whoever won on to win the White House. It missed in 1976 when Jimmy Carter won, and it also missed uh, for Bill Clinton's re-election at win. Um, but Colorado just recently kind of kind of plays to the tune that the reason Ohio is a swing state. It is, in a sense, a microcosm of the United States. Um, because it has a very strong urban development with Denver. It has a very diverse suburban network that surround it, but also very rural um, and full of farmers and ranchers. So it has a very good mix of what the United States has. Before I let you go tonight, Connor, I wanted to ask you about some of the amendments that are on the ballot. Now, we briefly touched on Amendment S, changing the state personnel system. I wanted to ask you first about 65 um, and kind of what that means. We, we also touched on it briefly earlier, but kind of go in depth a little bit if you will. Yeah, 65, uh, there's only two states that have this kind of amendment on their ballot this year. Colorado is one and Montana is the other. And so like we talked about earlier, uh, when Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, uh, they ruled that um, corporations and unions uh, could make contributions because if they, if they would not allow them to, it would be unconstitutional in freedom of speech and that sort of thing. So Amendment 65 is kind of a way to suggest um, to members of Congress to take action in uh, amending the Constitution and taking kind of like the political influence of corporations out of races. Okay, and uh, finally, Amendment 64. This is the big one on the ballot this year. Highly controversial. Uh, right now, it's still up 5347 in the state. That's with very few precincts reporting. Yeah. But just kind of talk about um, what what 64 would do and what would change if 64 passes. Well, if 64 passed, uh, the first thing that would change is, is obviously marijuana would be legal, uh, but it would be to the age of 21, and they would do their best to regulate it like alcohol. Now, there are many for and against for this amendment. Uh, for, there's a couple, would definitely be uh, decrimin decriminalizing the industry, bringing uh, police and other members of our law enforcement and redistributing them to other areas where they could be more effective. But the against, and this is a very important one, um, is that f this, this law, under federal law, it prevents um, banks from loaning money that, uh, that will use activities from um, marijuana. So, because in the sense that when you leave Colorado and you do have marijuana on you, it becomes a federal offense. So there is a pretty good strong case against it, but we'll have to see what happens. How about the case for S? How is that kind of looking? The case for S, um, it, it really just depends. We'll see. It, uh, it's definitely going to change the hiring of state personnel within the state. Um, it's going to offer, like we said, a lot of benefits to veterans, but it will also offer kind of a set of standardized testing when you are in the interview process with the hope of getting the best candidate for the job. But the against argue that it's going to offer the governor, whoever is in power at that time, a little too much control to choose people who ideologically uh, believe in the same things they do, that sort of thing. All right. Uh, Connor McCabe, thank you for joining us. Right now, we're going to toss it to our own Jamie Arterburn for a uh, breaking update. Jamie? Yes, Ben, right now we have the update for New Hampshire. They voted 54% 54 <clears throat> for Obama and 44% for Romney. And right now, the Electoral College is at 158 for Obama and 163 for Romney. 
So um, Connor will be back later on in the show when Colorado results start to come in. Stick around, you're watching Decision 2012 brought to you by UNC's Bear News. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. Don't look at me. Your hair's a bit frizzy today. Aww. You should pick that up. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. Loser. Here, let me help you with that. Oops. <laughs> Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look. Your crush is looking at you. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> they want to help but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you because no one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit StopBullying.gov. Measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are the number one killer of children 1 through 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. Brush, brushy, brush, brushy, brush, brush your teeth. Every day and every night. Brush, 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 brush. Now let your parents do just what you gotta do. Let them have your toothbrush so that they can brushy brush your teeth. Welcome back. I'm Tara Martinez. With the elections coming to a close, we'll have, we have seen quite a bit of both President Barack Obama and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney. But what about their wives? Sometimes lost and forgotten in the election process, the wives play a big part in the campaign trails and have had a lot of, excuse me, and have a lot, a lot of pressure on them as well. First, Michelle, uh, excuse me, excuse, first Michelle. Obama and Ann Romney both say they have concerns when their husbands hit the campaign trails. Bear News reporter Samantha Fox has more. So right now I'm here with Becca Hoyd. Thanks for joining us, Becca. She is the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Senate. Now tell me a little bit, I know you've had a big part in the election this season, and now tell me what have you done to get the word out about the vote this year? Well, first off, I'd like to thank you guys and oh, Bear News for having me. Um, but we've done a lot of things, mostly through programming. So we had three voter registration events on campus right. that we teamed up with housing and um, UPC. I've also done student senate sponsored uh, vice president or er, presidential watch party for the very first presidential um, oh, yeah. er, de debate. Sorry. Good. And then um, the second thing, the biggest thing that we've done so far is the Rock the Boat campaign, which mm -hmm. is an MTV sponsored campaign. Awesome. Um, and they came to campus and got people excited to vote. And now we're hosting an election watch party. Yeah, I heard that Rock the Boat was quite the event. There was a good turnout, so it that looked was. like a it lot was of a fun. Great 
Also, um, what was registration like this on campus? What what efforts did you guys put forth to get young voters to register this year? So like I said, we had three different events. One was on Constitution Day, one took place on West Campus, and the other took place on Central Campus. Mm -hmm. And um, between that and then the two main nonpartisan um, voter registration uh, organizations on campus, we registered over 2,000 students. Awesome. That was my next question. 2,000 voters. That is awesome. Yep. So in 2008, obviously Obama's large vote came from youth voters, college voters. Is that any different this year? Um, I can't tell you like specific statistics, but in any election, youth is going to be a huge, huge voting uh, pool because they've never been able to vote before, right? right? So yeah. um, it's not something that everyone's been able to have forever, and so I think it's something that people should take advantage of. Awesome, great. So you said about 2,000 people and mm -hmm. 2,000 college students were registered with you. Um, and how active have you seen the UNC population in regards to this year's election? Um, I was a little worried in the beginning. It's hard to get, you know, sometimes when it's too far away, it's hard to get people excited about it. But right. within these, in this last month, I would say there's been a huge increase. Um, in knowledge and people wanting, getting excited to vote and wanting resources about who to vote for. So that's been really encouraging. It's, a, it's good to see college voters being interested and in wanting to be educated about that. So that's exciting. Absolutely. So, also, we know that Colorado is purple state or swing state, as most people know. So how important is it for Colorado youth to vote, in your opinion? <laughs> Very important. Yes. So um, it's kind of like, like I said, a hidden demographic that's not always taken advantage of. And it can be the deciding factor in any state, for that matter toss up or not so great and also our last, last question for you um, who would you say or what would you say to those especially college voters to say oh my vote doesn't count I won't do it I don't want to do it it's just so hairy I don't want to worry about it what would you say to them you're absolutely wrong <laughs> um, they, like I said earlier uh, not everyone in every demographic has had the opportunity to vote I know I take it very seriously as a woman and right. a lot of other people take it very seriously and it's something that you should exercise your right for great. thank you so much Becca thank for being you. with us so I have a, a good question to ask you, and as soon as I think about it, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of those times you get sandbagged on the Sure. <laughs> so I do have one, uh, one question that has, I have wondered. Uh, in 2008, the youth vote was so incredibly high, mm -hmm. just so incredibly high, higher than it has ever been by probably more than twice. Mm -hmm. it, do you see that happening again this year? Um, I don't see it happening... Well, I should take that back. I don't necessarily see it happening just here, but I do see it happening kind of across um, the nation. So um, it's kind of something here at UNC, I've seen a height in voting, but necessarily like in the state of Colorado, no. Okay, now we have that wives package from, from uh, with Samantha Fox. So we'll go to that right now. Both the First Lady and Ann Romney have been working hard on the campaign trails, campaigning for their husbands. It has been a long and hard campaign trail, something that has impacted both them and their children. Along the way, both women have shared their fears and apprehension in wanting their husbands to campaign. During a recent stop at The View, Ann and her son Josh talk about the impact the campaign has had on both of them. Uh, but, you know, you, you really don't like to see your dad get beat up by the media or, or President Obama or whatever it is, and so you take it pretty personally. But I, I think that was just something he was saying off the cuff, and I, I assure you he didn't mean it. So I've, I've just opted to stay in a good place, a happy place. Smart. A, 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 you know, positive, positive place. Right. And so I don't want to get myself upset, so I am not watching television for the moment. While I believed deeply in my husband's vision for this country, and I was certain he would make an extraordinary president, like any mother, I was worried about what it would mean for our girls if he got that chance. Now, how would we keep them grounded under the glare of the national spotlight? How would they feel being uprooted from their school, their friends, and the only home they'd ever known? See, our life before moving to Washington was was filled with simple joys. I'm Samantha Fox, Bear News. Well, this election has proven to be very exciting for Colorado. Each party has made several stops in Colorado. Vice President Joe Biden recently stopped here in Greeley. Bear News reporter Ben Warwick has that story. As I'm here at Island Grove Regional Park in North Greeley, where Vice President Joe Biden just spoke to a group of about a thousand, now fresh off of his debate with Vice Presidential Candidate uh, Paul Ryan and President Barack Obama's debate with Mitt Romney, he hit many key points, three of which were women's rights, middle class and job creation, and the expanded federal aid and Pell Grants. 
After standing in the cold for hours, the Greeley crowd gave the vice president a warm reception, and he responded by giving the crowd of mostly college students exactly what they wanted to hear. 600,000 of those high-tech manufacturing jobs already exist. They're just looking for skilled personnel. Cut the growth of tuition in half and expand the student aid so more kids can afford to get to college. Colorado's own Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, introduced the Vice President and spoke on the importance of green energy and agriculture, especially to the residents of the state's Eastern Plains region. And we know when you look at the farmers and the ranchers here in Weld County and across Eastern Plains, that they're doing better than they have in many, many decades, and it's because of the leadership of this president and this vice president. We also know that for rural America, that securing the nation's energy future is something that we have got to do, and we're capturing the power, yes, of oil and natural gas as we're doing Weld County, but also we need to capture the power of the sun and the power of the wind and the power of geothermal. This administration has doubled renewable energy in just four years for the United States of America. Another thing he talked about was the shortfalls of the Romney-Ryan tax plan, calling them decent men, but fundamentally wrong. They're, they're good, decent men, but they have such a fundamentally different view of the country than we do. We have a very different way forward. We have a plan. First, on taxes. We already cut taxes for the middle class by $3,600. We've cut tax more than a dozen times for small businesses. We're going to keep insisting on keeping the tuition tax credit, continuing the child care tax credit for working families, and we're going to make permanent the middle class tax cut. Vice President Biden ended his speech by saying that the Romney-Ryan plan is going back to the future of failed policies and that it's never a good bet to bet against America. From Island Grove Regional Park in North Greeley, I'm Ben Warwick, Bear News. Thanks, Ben. As of right now, we have three more states to be updated, and both Utah and Montana's vote are both going to Romney. Utah with a percentage of 58 to 40, and Montana with a, with a split of 56 to 42. And as of right now, New Mexico is going with Obama with, um, with a 54 to 42 percent, and the electoral votes right now are 163 for Obama and 163 for Romney. Again, a very close campaign going on right now. I'm going to toss it back over to Dr. Edwards right now. Well, that is about as close as you can get. Well, UNC students had a chance to show that they have an impact on the election. UNC Student uh, Senate presented Rock the Vote. That was a campaign event to educate college voters. The Rock the Vote, the Vote campaign bus traveled from Texas to the UC parking lot to inform students to vote. With music, free samples, and prizes, students came to the event to have fun. Students had the opportunity to win prizes from drawings and by dancing. The prizes included t-shirts, UNC gear, and gift cards. Students also had the chance to try different uh, uh, water enhancements and also a new yogurt drink at the yogurt stand. Free sunglasses were up for grabs. And the most popular place for students was under the Assassin's Creed 3 tent. Students were able to test run a free trial of the game after they received a free Assassin's Creed 3 t-shirt. Well, students were informed about the presidential campaign while having just a little bit of fun. Okay, so I guess we're going to go to break now. So we would like to thank you for being with us and you're watching Decision 2012 brought to you by UNC Bear News. Bad stats?